for a minute. I'm sick of waiting for state or federal government to come to your aid. So people are doing that at the local level and forcing change from the bottom up, so it's pretty good. Um, can I just, Andrew, can I put, do a plug for GNI right now? And uh, I saw the email came out today about the potential change in the FCC rules. So I, I would encourage people to go to GNET's website. It could drastically impact the income that comes into GNET, as I understand it, um, for funding to keep them going. And GNET has been a huge partner of ours. Andrew's at our farmer's market. He's here just about every month. If not, there's a videographer here. So um, community communications through that local TV is huge. I would encourage you to go there, because I, I didn't completely look at it tonight, but I think there's a link out where you can go and voice your opinion to the federal government about the change in the FCC rules. So that's my little plug for GNA. Make sure that's on TV. Okay. Um, look at, um, I, I want to introduce Commissioner Katie Buckley, um, the Commissioner of the Department of Housing and Community Development for the State of Vermont. Um, Katie agreed to come down tonight. Um, she lives in the southern part of the state, on, on the eastern side of the state. But she came all the way from Montpelier today, and she's going back there tonight. And so we greatly appreciate the fact that you came. Um, prior to taking over and being appointed by Governor Scott um, as the Commissioner of um, Housing and Community Development, um, Katie was very active in her community in Guilford. In fact, served as the first town administrator in Guilford. And uh, she'll tell a little bit of that story tonight. So without further ado, I want to turn over the uh, podium to, to Katie. Welcome and thank you so much for being here. of grassroots in my own community so when I come to other communities now in my role I get so excited that other great work is taking place and I couldn't agree with you more Jim that um, this work no one's going to come do it for you and you really need to do it from the ground up and it's amazing to see this many people that have come out on a Tuesday are we Tuesday is that my days all blur together a Tuesday night at 6 30 to participate in your community. I mean, that's astounding. I've been to countless public meetings where you have almost no attendance. So to see everyone at every table, you don't even have to tell people to come to the front of the room. It's pretty wonderful. So um, I, I was invited into your process and connected with Jim Baker through my agency secretary, Mike Sherling, um, who, Jim, I think you were talking about the Arlington Renewal Project to um, Secretary Sherling, who said, you know, you should, you should connect with my, my commissioner of um, housing and community development because a lot of the work that you're doing really dovetails with the work of her department. And in talking to Jim, we have a connection through the Vermont State Police. So we, we got on a more um, conversational level with each other pretty quickly. And I think he asked me, so how did you end up becoming the commissioner of housing and community development? And I said, well, I think it started with me being a town administrator and being on the receiving end of every piece of funding that my agency, my department grants out. So I was a frequent flyer in my department um, when I took my job and uh, was appointed by the governor in that I already knew my entire staff because I was a grantee of every program with the exception of barn grants. That was the only program that I didn't take advantage of because the town didn't have a barn. Otherwise, I probably would have applied for the funding. Um, so we talked a little bit about my history as a town administrator. Um, it brought me into uh, a short career in affordable housing development and um, actually had me returning to the town for a year before um, I was appointed by the governor. So uh, I come with uh, a little bit of grit and some real life experience of working in a small town. Um, and so when I was talking with Jim about your revitalization efforts, a lot of the work that you're doing in your community and a lot of your committee breakouts, um, the work and the projects that you're gonna be undertaking dovetails perfectly with what we do. I'm just gonna read my department's mission statement and it's to support the vibrant and resilient communities, promote safe and affordable housing for all, protect the state's historic resources and improve the quality of life for Vermonters. You have a beautiful historic, two historic villages that are designated village centers 
through my department, which opens you up for priority for funding. You have a gorgeous Main Street, um, which, which has so much opportunity. Um, we have my team, two of my team members came down today and met with Joshua and you speak, you're yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, to talk about some of the work that we're doing um, and had a really great positive meeting with them. Um, you've done great planning. You're, you're, I think in, uh, one of the pieces I read about Arlington was you just need a little shining up. Is that what someone said? Um, you, have, you have so much here, so much potential. You just need a little bit of um, bringing together and a little bit of help. And Jim asked me to talk a little bit about my experience as a town administrator. So I'm going to shift off my commissioner hat and put on my town administrator hat that really is what led me to stand here today. Um, I was the town of Guilford's first town administrator uh, when I first returned to the world of work after having two amazing kids, uh, I was hired part-time by the Guilford Select Board. Uh, they had an opening in their administrative assistant position and I thought it would be a great entree back into the workforce for me, still allow me to be a, a very engaged hands-on mother, still allow me to volunteer in the school, all of that stuff. It was right next to the school, worked perfectly. Um, when I took my role, we had a longtime town clerk treasurer we had just retired and we had a newly elected person um, taking the reins in that office who didn't have as much experience, uh, no, no experience in municipal government um, and not as much experience in finance. And pretty quickly we had a churn there and she resigned leaving a vacancy there. So I was part time. My job was quickly uh, taking on more tasks than what was in my job description. I was happy to take them on. It was a wonderful <coughs> challenge. Um, and in taking on that role, I quickly realized that there was so much potential that the town wasn't realizing because of lack of capacity. Um, so I was able to bring a lot more than just creating a board agenda and taking minutes. Um, that in doing that work, I was able to see opportunity in that there are all of these wonderful things called Grants. Does everybody know what a grant is? <laughs> I see a lot of laughing, a lot of smiling. Um, it is. A grant is money, and people call it free money, and there's really nothing free about it because you have to work to get it, and then once you have it, you have to work to administer it to ensure that you're using those public dollars um, in a way that best meets the program requirements but really honors the, the intent of those public dollars. So. Um, there are grant opportunities throughout state government, throughout federal government. There are foundation grants. There are all different types of grants that are available to different organizations and municipalities can apply for almost all of them. Um, it's, it was almost like a money tree for me in my role that we had taxes which funded our regular operations, and I knew how sensitive everybody was about taxes. I mean, who wants to see their tax bill go up? No hands. Uh, who would like to see other funding come into your town that's not put on the backs of the taxpayers? Raise your hand. <laughs> yes, that's the goal of the exercise. So um, we had, we were a town that was, uh, we reacted because we didn't, we had our annual operating budget, and that's what it funded, that's it. So if something happened, we had to figure out how to pay for it in a very reactionary way. We um, went from being a town who every year had an article on their town meeting warning. Does anyone want to guess what it is? Do, do the voters of the town of Arlington authorize the select board to Borrow in anticipation of taxes. Yes. We no longer have that article on our town meeting warning because we don't have to do that anymore because our cash flow allows for us to not have to do that. We collect taxes once a year. They're done, collected on October 15th. So that means that from July 1 till October 15th, fundamentally we have no cash, right? Uh, we, we now have enough cushion and float so that we are able to not have to borrow. Um, and things are set up in such a way that we don't have to do that. So that's 
interest, which to me I used to call interest to my taxpayers, that's a big black hole into which you throw your tax dollars. You get nothing for that. We evolved away from um, taking debt to bridge our tax money. We evolved away from taking debt to fund our equipment needs. We were taking a ridiculous amount of debt to fund buying a grader. Uh, we were spent, I think we spent $23,000 in interest on our grader, and it was unnecessary to do if we just reorganized our finances. So we worked to do that. And we started to take an approach that wasn't a reactionary approach to being proactive and planning for the future, which I'm going to look right at Jim Sullivan in the back, because he loves that, working for the Regional Planning Commission, which is really being thoughtful, really being intentional, really engaging the community and the voters to say, what do you want for your community, and how do we create a long-term plan for that? Um, we created a capital program in which we saved money um, to put away for our equipment needs, to put away for our capital improvement needs. We did a capital needs assessment on every building in town that was town-owned property so that we could come up with a maintenance plan and schedule for that so that we weren't saying, oh my gosh, we need to replace the roof because it's leaking. It's like, well, we knew we had to replace that for the last 25 years from when we installed the roof. We could have been planning for that all along. So uh, it was a really big shift in a mindset. Um, we had our Green River Covered Bridge, which uh, had <coughs> deferred maintenance on it. That, uh, we got a bridge inspection report from the state of Vermont that said, you better watch out for your bridge. You're going to have to change your load rating. And it got people prickly and up in arms, and we had no money to fund and repair. And it was the major connector to probably about a third of our residents on the other side of the river. Uh, and it was a three quarters of a million dollar fix, and we were unprepared. So. We wrote grants, we got three quarters of a million dollars, and then we put a thoughtful strategic savings plan away and got other grant funding and paid for the repair. Otherwise, that all would have went on the backs of taxpayers, or we would have had to close the bridge down, forcing our residents for an 18-mile detour through Massachusetts. Can't do that. Um, so during my tenure, uh, we we raised in five years almost $3 million in grant money. And I, I, I do have to caveat by saying one million of that was due to Tropical Storm Irene. So that was, a million of that was a successful um, FEMA claim that we had. Uh, but we raised money to fund a water line. Uh, we didn't have municipal water and it was the difference in our community of having municipal water was we now have a 25 seat cafe that we couldn't have before because it was on a private well. Um, and we couldn't get permitted for that. We have 24 units of affordable housing that we would not have been able to have because there wasn't enough water capacity in the village. It was maxed out. Um, we have fire hydrants for our fire department in our most densely populate, populated area of town for them to have fire protection and be able to fill their fire trucks without having to drive to the river to the dry hydrant to fill up their truck. Uh, we had a, a one of our firemen fall on ice trying to fill the truck from the river. So now they have a fire hydrant at the fire station that they can fill their tanker up with. Um, we, have, we have a lot, and a lot of that was due to the fact that we suddenly took on a different approach to our town. Um, and I, I worked to serve our select board. That was what my job was. Uh, a, I think there's been a little bit of dialogue around town manager versus town administrator, and a town administrator works at the discretion of the select board. Um, I worked for a board when I was first hired who was doing a lot of work on a very limited basis because they all had jobs. They were there fundamentally as volunteers, and to start to read and understand the Vermont statutes, Title 24, that guides their work, they didn't have the capacity or the bandwidth to do that. So there were a lot of opportunities that um, weren't being taken advantage of and um, things that they could have been doing better and more efficient if they just had a little bit of support. So a lot of my job with the select board was 
researching the laws, making sure that they were following the laws, um, and mitigating any risk uh, for the town. So that all of their decision making was extremely well informed. I did all of the homework and provided all of the background information prior to a board meeting so that when they showed up for that board meeting, they already had all their research done, they already had all of their printed materials needed that they needed to make the decisions. They already had all of their statutory reference that guided them. Um, one of the biggest missteps that can really trip up a select board is executive sessions. And we were using executive sessions completely illegally. And we began to change that. And really it was a culture shift. Um, and it was, as I was being educated, we all were educated together and we got to make these really great decisions for our community. Uh, one of the wonderful things about my role was I was not an elected official. So I was allowed to engage in a way with community members, uh, with local nonprofits that we had that bridges the gap of government. Um, in my particular town, we had no zoning and we had a nonprofit who formed to guide the socially responsible development of our village center in the absence of zoning. So, I was able to work with that nonprofit <coughs> to help them source funds for grant writing, to do master planning in the village, to do all of those things that we just didn't have the staff or capacity to do. I was the only staff person. Um, so I was able to use community members and collaborate and partner with community members in such a way that it rounded out our town government. So it. So it was almost like the taking all the threads of your town and weaving it together to a nice tight fabric so that people were talking together, they were sharing information together, we were reducing overlap in terms of, well, if your organization's doing this, well, my organization is doing this, so why are we both doing this? Well, maybe we can share a person. But it, it started to have those conversations bubble up. Um, I wrote a lot of grants. and. I think I'm standing here today because I wrote a lot of grants really successfully and I went for every grant that I wrote I would go take my grant applications you need to have 16 copies of your grant um, along with a digital copy and then I would make all the copies package them up nicely drive them to Montpelier and the person who is the grant recipient I walked in delivered them shook their hands and said I'm available for any questions here's my card I'd be happy to talk to you. I didn't get one grant in the very beginning. It was a transportation alternative grant, and it was the very first grant I ever wrote, and I didn't get it. And I drove up to Montpelier, and I met with the person and said, here's my grant application. Tell me why I didn't get it. I want to know exactly why we weren't funded. And they sat with me for over an hour, and they talked to me through my application, and I went back, and I got two more successful grants after that. And now I work for the state. I'm blessed with my role. Um, and we want communities to succeed. And we have funding available. And it's very competitive. And in order for you to get that funding, you need a really good application, which means you need somebody who is taking all of the threads and weaving them together. And I think you're doing that on a very volunteer basis right now. It's what it feels like. I, I'm not from Arlington. I'm not going to pretend I know what's going on in your community. I just know what I've been exposed to. Um, and it's what happens all over Vermont in rural Vermont. And I love rural Vermont. We talk a lot about Chittenden County, and then there's the rest of Vermont. And there is so much potential in rural Vermont. And it's, it's systemic throughout the country, as Jim mentioned, that nobody's going to do it for you. You do it for yourself. You have all the power. You have all the capacity, probably a lot of it, right in this room, to make that change. And you need some people to tie the pieces together so that you end up with that tight fabric. Um, and I, I don't want to talk too, too much about a town administrator, um, but it is a great, it's a great way of town coming together for just one position, I'm still funding the two town administrators that have followed me from my town. 
So if you were to add up all the money that was raised through grants, just on my watch, that person's still already being funded today. And, and if you think about it in that way, it's maybe the only position in town government that can actually fundamentally fund their own position. And I think if you asked, is there a highway foreman here tonight? No. No? Do you know your highway foreman? I'm going to guess that a lot of your budget's driven by highway. Am I right? <laughs> right. And I'm going to guess that you all know how much a piece of equipment costs, or how much it costs for a truckload of gravel, or there's this little thing called Act 164. Am I right, Jim? Is it Act 164? Act 64? That was the, you need your general permit now for highway? Uh, can we all, all I know is the name. Yeah, I don't know the number. Okay. So towns have to suddenly um, do an inventory of their erosion control areas that they need to take care of. And I'm sure your highway foreman knows all about that. And if you write one grant to the Better Roads program, write two. Write two. And that will fund. If you get that funding, that you just funded your town administrator for a year. That's the reality of it. And you have to do that work. It's not like, uh, oh, we're just going to put a, a new building up. You have to do that road work. And there's money out there. If you have to do paving, there's money out there through your district office. Go get it. If you have a structure that you need money for, like a bridge in town, there's structure, structures money through your district office. If you want sidewalks, there's transportation money for that. Go get it. So if you want these things, and I'm sure you do, because most communities do. And even if you don't want anything new, but you want to maintain what you have, use grants to do that. They're out there. But you need somebody who is watching the big picture, who works collaboratively with the select board, and does the work for the select board. And that's what a town administrator can do for you. Um, and they work collaboratively with all the local officials, with the planning commission, with the conservation commission, with the town clerk treasurer. And it can be that person that creates the safety net in the network. So um, I don't know if anyone has any questions. Yes. I do. Because we are very doing this. Yes. Um, what is your background that prepared you for this position? Motherhood. <laughs> <laughs> the best. The best. I think if you can manage kids and, and but I actually have a retail background. Yeah, in my early years, that was what I had, both corporate and um, in the fields, running an actual business on Church Street. So, but I did. I took a grant writing course. Um, I worked. Guilford is also my community, so I have deep passion for my community. Uh, I, there were a lot of things that I wanted to see happen there. So selfishly, I did a lot of that work because I'm passionate about the people that I live with and share my life with and call my home. But the other question yeah, is, you I said when you started, you were um, part time. I was. Did that change after a while? Did you get to after about six months? Oh. Yeah, I mean, after about six months, I was taking on more and more and more, and I had to step back and say, I'm not actually. That's not actually in my job description, and I'm not actually getting paid to do that work. And if you want me to do that work, I'm going to need more time in the day to do it and I'm gonna need my relationship more formalized in that regard. So I'm happy to do it, but we need to work together to get there. So I pretty quickly went from part-time to full-time, and um, you know we had a lot of, every town's a little bit different. We happen to have a little bit of fragility with our town finances, so I stepped in and helped out doing that and reorganized all of our town finances um, and got everything into a, a uh, financial software program, Nemeric, if anybody knows what that is, and um, evolved away from spreadsheets and journals and uh, put a place, a uh, process in place for internal control so we had uh, some cash control. So during my tenure, we had uh, a partner organization that we worked with, the Algiers Fire District, that had uh, an $84,000 embezzlement that we discovered. So uh, it, it, it just reaffirmed for the board uh, how great it was that we had put these financial controls in place before that took place. So they were acutely aware 
when they watched the embezzlement occur, how, how protected the town actually was. And we ended up stepping in and um, taking over the finances for the fire district, so to insulate them through that embezzlement or any, um, to mitigate risk for the future for that organization, so. Yes? Would you consider moving to Arlington? <laughs> <laughs> um, actually, yeah, I would. Um, I, I have to tell you, you have, you have all the right stuff here. For the right person to come, I wish I had everything that you have here when I took Guilford on. We didn't have any of that. I mean, it was really, uh, I, I drove into a very derelict looking village center when I first moved to town. Um, at the time, my husband and I, we built a house and ironically, <laughs> uh, the land that we bought to build our house on, for weeks I couldn't find it because the for sale sign kept getting torn down by the neighbor. And so finally I called the realtor back up and said, you're going to have to just meet me there because I can't find this place. So I go there, we end up buying the land. Um, and later I learned after I interviewed for the administrative assistant job with the chair of the, it was, it, I won't even go over it. The interview process was, <laughs> was the weirdest interview process I ever went through. Um, but the chair of the select board was my neighbor. So after my interview, I'm thinking, I, I don't think I got that. I got into my sweatpants and sitting down to dinner at the table with my family and there's a knock at my back door and it's the chair of the select board <laughs> saying, I just wanted to tell you, you got the job. I was like, great. And then I learned he was the one that was taking down the sign. <laughs> he down the sign. And so after a few, few years of working there, I said to him, I said, aren't you glad? Aren't you glad that I ended up moving next door? He's like, I gotta say, I was the one who took the sign down. I, go, I know you are. So because now I know everything in town and I know that you did that. Um, but we ended up having a, a great relationship and um, it, it, was, it was some of the most rewarding. I have a fantastic job now, but working in your community and working to improve your community and making it a better place and working collaboratively with the people who live there as well, nothing's more rewarding. It really isn't. It, you're able to on the local level, I love the local level, because state government is like trying to move the Titanic. It is, and in local government, you have a Boston whaler. You do, you, if, whatever you want to do, you can pretty quickly execute it. Um, and, and all of that lies within you. It really does, and, and I know it's a scary leap, but I'd be willing to bet that every town that you talk to that has a town administrator, they say, wow, I don't know how we survive for that long without that support. Um, they work for the board at the discretion of the board. If they do a great job, fantastic. If they do a lousy job, fire them. It's that easy. It's not elected official. There's no statutory tie to it. They work at the discretion of the board um, and they offer that support. That, you know what? Local government's really complicated really complicated. You're stewards of a lot of money. And if, assuming, are there select board members in the room? I'm assuming there is. You're, you're sheepish about me. Get that hand up there. That's a huge honor. Huge honor to be on a select board. It's a huge job. And just think of how much more successful you'd be in your role if you didn't have to do all of that legwork to just get to the point where you're feeling sort of comfortable in a decision. There's a lot to it. There's a whole title. There's more than a whole title in, in, in a Vermont statute that guides municipal work. I mean, it's complicated. And there's a lot of money tied to it. And you have those little things called taxpayers who you need to make sure you're, you're honoring their, their vote and that um, you're spending their dollars wisely and that you're getting the most bang for the buck. And when you have somebody who's hired to do that, that that's what their job is, is to make sure that you steward and you shepherd the work of the leaders of your community, you can have more confidence in what you're doing, mm -hmm. for sure. Yeah, Katie, was there any uh, opposition by the select board in uh, Guilford prior to your coming on board to that position? Or was there any opposition from the uh, taxpayers 
prior to your coming on? <coughs> there was opposition. And how was it overcome? Um, obviously, whenever you put an increase in a municipal budget, there's going to be opposition. Nobody wants their taxes to go up. Um, and there's a lot of um, thinking that, you know what, we're doing fine. We're doing fine as a community. Um, and I was, I was already, sort of had my foot in the door because I was an administrative assistant in that position already, so it was really making the leap of changing that position and growing the role. Um, and I had done a fair amount of legwork, um, but I was essentially treated as a, a glorified secretary. And so I had to really, uh, as I said, I came from a background of retail, so I had to really sell not only the position, the need, and also myself in that position, that I'm the right person for it. Um, and there was some resistance, so I translated what that would look like in terms of um, a tax bill. Like, your taxes are gonna go up, but actually, <coughs> they might actually go, stay flat or even go down, if you were to calculate it in that way, that I'm bringing money into the town that's not being put on your tax bill. So there's that whole justification for that. Does that answer your question? So it was a, it was a lot of convincing for the select board. I had a three member select board at the time. Um, and I'd say two thirds of them were ambivalent <coughs> at first. And the more that I did, and really when I said to them, I'm not doing this anymore, that was the real, as I started to take things on, I said, look, I'm, I'm taking on a lot of financial work and responsibility that's way beyond agendas and minutes and running around town and posting the notices. Uh, so that's, I'm not doing that. And they're like, well, then who's going to do that? I said, I, I don't know. I don't know who's going to do that, but I'm not unless there's some changes made. I, I need to, uh, I, how have you done it before? It's like, well, everything's different now. I said, well, I, I don't, I'm not quite sure. So it's really s stepping forward and then stepping back and then having those conversations of long-term planning and what, you re what we really want as a community. Um, and, and I'll tell you, after one, the first year of having the board, uh, on town meeting day, I don't know how you all do town meeting, but in our town, we have the, uh, each year we flip flop. The town portions first or the school portions first. And the, so the town goes up and the very first articles are in the budget. And they sit in front of the room and they talk about the budget. And every year there's questions from the audience and there's a lot of uncertainty because people aren't actually sure how to answer it. And that first year that I was town administrator, I just sat, they got a question from the audience, and they just looked down, I go, do you want me to answer it? And they just passed the mic down to me, and I answered all the questions on the budget. Because I had the deepest awareness and the deepest understanding of the budget. I had worked collaboratively with the treasurer. I had worked collaboratively with the select board. I worked with the highway foreman. I knew his budget. I knew all of the different, I worked with the planning commission, conservation commission, cemetery commission. I worked with the human services organizations. <coughs> I had restructured the warning so that it went um, in a way that was more fluid and made sense. Um, that it was worded legally correctly, that it had statutory references where it needed those statutory references so that if anyone ever had an issue, it was tried and true legally. It's all there, it was, it was bulletproof. Um, and after that, I, I, I made them cheat sheets so that they would then be able to be fluent and then we evolved in terms of how people talked about town finances um, because that was a weakness for us. Uh, the select board didn't really have fluency about the town budget. Um, there was a bit of a disconnect between the treasurer and the select board, and um, I was able to bridge the gap so that we all started working and everybody knew what everybody else was doing, um, and it flowed much more smoothly. So, any other questions? I have one more question. Sure. Um, so, hey, as um, the grants that you wrote for Guilford, do all of those grants go through the through, through your commission, through no, your department? No, no. Oh, okay. No, like for um, 
one of the grants was securing, I was, uh, part of my role that I saw as my role was a relationship builder. So I made sure I knew uh, all of the events locally where I would connect with my local legislators. I knew very well, they knew me very well. Um, I made sure I had a voice in Montpelier through them. Talked about what our local concerns were as a municipality, what I wanted my local legislator to keep an ear for. These are the things we need in our community. These are the things I want you to be a champion for when you go into that state house. Um, I made sure I got to know members, uh, staff of the congressional delegation on the federal level. Uh, it enabled us to get, mm, I want to say three quarters of a million dollars for our, our water line project. If we didn't have that, we would never have gotten a water line. So um, having those relationships, I knew, got to know, I knew the commissioner, my position before. Um, I made it my business to know as many people in the state as I could stick my hand out any room. Uh, when I used to go to Vermont League of Cities and Towns, they would have workshops where, you know, planning and zoning forum, the town health officer, the <coughs> selection uh, workshop, town fair. I would go there knowing who was going to be there. And it was less about what was on the agenda for the workshop, and it was more about who's in the room. I need to talk to you at the coffee break, you at lunch, I'm sitting next to you. And <coughs> it was that sort of strategic, um, what, what, how can I use this $65 that the town spent on my registration fee, how can I get the most bang out of that 65 bucks? So that was what. And that's how then you found these different grants yeah. through different departments. Yeah, and the, all of the state's programs, the state, uh, I know, I'm there now. You know, I'm, I keep looking at Jim because he knows why. <coughs> it's complicated. There are so many different programs. And with the projects that you want to do, you can tell so many different stories in <coughs> any project. So we had. I'll use a, a local project as an example. We had the Guilford Country Store. So the Guilford Country Store had closed for five years because um, the owner had passed away, the wife couldn't carry it on, so uh, she was contemplating selling it to a 7-Eleven. So we in the community felt we can't lose our general store. So this nonprofit that I mentioned earlier um, that was the safety net for government, they bought the building. And they started to go through, and I worked with them. Um, so the story that we told was a story of historic preservation to save this historic building that was a stagecoach stop in the early 1800s. In the early 1800s, Guilford was the largest town in Vermont. <coughs> so we got to tell that rich history story and get preservation money through that, historic preservation money. Um, we, Oh, I have to keep, we, we were part of um, the town's designated village center program, which ironically is now a program that's run out of my department. Um, so we were uh, eligible to write and receive uh, tax credits. So we got tax credits to help fund our rehab. Um, we raised locally a, a million dollars to completely save that building, which was collapsing in on itself. Um, and we now have in that building um, but we have, we have municipal water, we have just a ridiculous amount of grants that we wrote. Um, we had a Vermont Community Development Program grant. Um, I won't bore you with all the grants that we've gotten. Um, but we raised about a million dollars. We now have uh, a, a reopened general store and cafe. It is the gathering place for our community. Everybody goes there. It has the bulletin board where everything's posted, all the gossip's there, all the political fighting is there. It's fabulous. Um, we also have a uh, wholesale bakery that opened in the back. Um, we are contemplating on the second floor a co-working hub because we have fiber that runs right in the middle of the village, and I bet you probably have fiber that runs right through the middle of this village. Uh, I could be wrong. Um, but it's that kind of, and working for the town, the town was the sponsor for some of those grants, okay? So the town worked collaboratively with the nonprofit saying, okay, what are you going to do? What are we going to do? And work together. And most of the work that took place in the revitalization of that village was partnerships <coughs> of municipality with nonprofits who were able to get it done in the absence of the town. So 
Yes. Katie, is there a um, wishful thinking probably, but is there a central database um, where you can research state and or yeah. federal grants like there is for foundations? Mm -hmm. I didn't think so. No, but there should be. We now have one on um, our agency. Our, our agency website, we have all of our programs, but I would love for the state to have a central location of all of our funding opportunities. I would also love for the state to have a central um, platform for all grants. So you apply for almost like a portal. And so all, the state has tons of programs, tons of different programs, and they all have different applications. Some are a fillable PDF. Some are a Word doc that's not very user friendly. Some are a grant platform called IntelliGrants, now called Gears. There's all of these different <coughs> platforms, and bless you, and they're all very different, and some are clunky, some are hard to maneuver, and it would be great if there was a central way of doing that. It would be a lot more efficient, both for government, there'd be a big cost associated with it. I'm sure that would be the answer why we don't do it. Um, but as a, for the applicants, it would make things so much easier for the applicant if they had, you learned one system and were able to operate in one system, it would make it so much easier for towns, for nonprofits, for everything. So. I hope I was helpful. And I hope I did. Um, again, it's a good deal to drive down here, drive back to Oh, I love this stuff. Uh, we, we appreciate your input. You know, I'm happy to stay. If you you're more than welcome to stay. Yeah, it's up to you. I know you guys have long run ahead. If you want to assign me to a committee. Yeah, we'll put it back here. I'll feel like I'm over you. Assign me. No, I love it. I don't, have, get to, I don't get to do this in my town anymore because I live halfway up north. So, so thank, thank you again. You're more than welcome to stay. Absolutely. So next on our agenda, announcements. Who has announcements? Anybody have announcements? I know Phyllis, you must. Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> can I, I maybe, can maybe, uh, maybe we could do this. Holly, would you brief us on the holiday celebration coming this sure. Saturday, please? Um, and then, Phyllis, you can follow me because I know you got something going on. I, I want to introduce the celebration by just reminding you all about what the phrase is, how we've described art, which is collaboration for the common good. And we had, we're actually we are having this amazing experience showing what that phrase means and putting together the holiday celebration. And it really is in two pieces. This past Saturday, some of you might have seen uh, a lot of people downtown, a lot of activity, putting up lights. And we had a request from the Lions Club that said, you know, we really are having trouble getting up those trees these days. And they were going to get small trees and put lights on them. And we said, no, we, we can do this. Volunteers from the high school, right? A group of high school kids came, helped. We had this incredible team, people doing electrical work, the high school kids doing the hanging, the Lions Club members coaching and explaining and supporting. It was just, again, it's everything that our wanted our community to be, which is community engagement. And that's all going to culminate um, this coming Saturday. And for those of you who haven't seen the agenda yet, it is a full day's worth of activities for our holiday celebration. We're going to start at 10 in the morning um, at the library with a movie for children, and they're going to be making cookies. Uh, we're going to be having a holiday bazaar, uh, the Garden Club, starting at 10 and going through, I believe, to 4. Um, then Burdett Commons is going to have more activities during the day for children and parents. And we're going to have Santa arriving by fire truck at 3.30. Um, and Santa will be residing in the basement of St. James Church. At the same time, the church has a number of creches that they're going to have out there from around the world and they'll be available all day long. And then the tree lighting. And the lighting of obviously more than the trees. You're gonna see that we have luminaries, you know, we have spot floodlights on our wreaths for the first time in front of Town Hall. So the tree lighting will be at 4.30, followed by hot chocolate and cookies. 
Oh, oh, oh yeah. good, good point. Thank you. She just reminded me of the Carolyn. Thank you. Um, followed by hot chocolate and cookies. And yes, Carolyn, and let me tell you about this. Again, the high school came through. The students are going to come down, um, start our caroling off. They'll be there to support our caroling. St. James is providing the books with the carols in them, so as many people, if you have forgotten some of the words, not to worry, we're gonna have the books there for everyone to join in with the high school students. And I should also say that this year is the first year we're going to have a menorah. And I want you to know that the high school built it, the high school shop class. So it has been, as I said, I am, I am so proud to have the opportunity to be part of this because this isn't, let me just give you the list of everybody who is working on this effort. The Garden Club, the Library, the Fire Department, St. James, the Community House, the Lions, the Masons, and Burdett Commons. I don't think I left anybody off, and if I did, oh, the high school I had mentioned them, but I thought, yes. But think about that. That's an incredibly long list of groups to come together. So. I would hope that you'll find time next Saturday. And by the way, we're, uh, we're a snow or sunshine or rain event. Whatever's going on with the weather, you should still come. Because Santa, as I said, will be in the church, inside the church. And a lot of the activity will be inside the community house, including the Garden Club's Bazaar, the Burdette Common activities, as well as the hot chocolate and cookies. So don't let the weather keep you away. And please let everybody know who is really come together to do an entire day's activity in celebration of the holiday, your attendance would mean a lot, I think. So thank you. Since holidays can be a stressful time, this Thursday between 5.30 and 7.30 at the library, we're gonna have some things to help you de-stress. We have chair massage, we have 15-minute uh, yoga sessions, we have coloring, we'll have tea and cookies, and we'll have activities for kids, so if anyone wants to bring their children, um, the kids can do their thing while you do your thing. Um, we also have our basket raffle going on. Um, we have a lot of baskets, about 24, that have been donated by different organizations and friends of the library. So we have tickets for that. Some of the baskets are on display at the banks and also at the library. And we're going to do, do the drawing for the baskets on the 18th of December, right after Santa's visit. Thank you. Thank you. Other announcements? <coughs> oh. um, I was recently contacted by the Masons. Um, every year the Masons do a skating party at the, at the rink. This year um, the plan is to do it either January 20th or January 27th. Um, they would like to, and they've talked to some other groups in town as well, but they'd like to do much more of a winter carnival on that on that date. Um, so I sort of said I'd bring it to the um, renewal project and see if we could maybe get some other groups involved along with um, the, probably the high school as well. Um, plan some other events for that day so just sort of make a note of it and we'll get in touch with with others but trying to get the word out if people want to do um, any other events connected with that um, that day direct party. Well, can we have kind of a planning meeting together? Yep. Maybe we get asked next Saturday. Oh yeah. Our project coordinator is free up. All right. For yep. project. And maybe we set that up. Yep. Because I hear you say that, if there's snow, I can see some cross-country events, snowshoeing mm -hmm. events in the park, you know, along with the, uh, with the uh, uh, ice skating and stuff, um, you know, uh, and maybe even use some of the, some of the property at the yellow barn for snowshoeing or whatever. So maybe we put a committee together to work on that. Okay? Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Florence, I, 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 I just have, I have to lead in with this one. Are you going to announce what I just asked you to announce? I, I was, you know, I was going to put a plug in for the play at the school oh, yeah, this weekend um, on Friday and Saturday night, but it's later than the uh, Christmas event. 
Um, you probably know the play 12 Angry Men. This is 12 Angry Jurors because there's going to be women or young women in the play too. But it's, it's 7 o'clock on both nights at the Mac Performing Arts Center at the high school. And we, uh, we have kids in the class in this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I, I know my granddaughter's mind told us as well as she does. Let's get to her side of the shower. So, uh, well, maybe we can see her rendition. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, we're not going to do that. Um, what I would say is when we talk about supporting our community and our school, sometimes I get frustrated when I go to the plays at the school and there's 15 or 20 people there. These kids work very hard at this. So it'd be a nice end of the day, especially on Saturday, to stop up and see the play. Um, you know, I think it's it's going to be. A, I have a good sense of what the play is about, and I think it's going to. I'm going to go both nights, so um, I, I would urge you to go. I, I know that um, um, Florence is way too modest to announce this, so I'm going to announce this. Her daughter Tess Belknap found out today that she was selected as an All-American soccer player. And so, Joe Biden once said on the floor to set up when the microphone was open, I'll leave one word out. That's a big deal. <laughs> <laughs> that is a big deal. And, uh, you know, for us that have had the privilege to watch um, Tess play soccer, as I, I said to her after the game, when, um, when we won the game, um, uh, she takes a lot of crap because she's such a skilled player. And she takes a lot of crap from referees, she takes a lot of crap from other players. She takes a lot of crap from other coaches. And uh, you know, I've watched this over three years of watching her play varsity, four years of watching her play varsity soccer. And um, she does it on the field with a lot of grace. And, and uh, you know, I've never seen her retaliate against a player. And uh, she's taken some real hard hits on the soccer field. And so she earned that, she deserves that. And uh, she's a very skilled player. Besides that, she's a great kid. So congratulations to you and Chris, as I said to you in a text today, it's a big deal. So again, congratulations. So I was going to announce the play, and I'll scratch it off my list, so I'm going to put another plug in. Please think about the play. Um, I was asked to announce by the, the uh, collaborative, which is, um, is um, the prevention collaborative um, that covers this area, um, Victoria Silby, um, tomorrow night at um, Floodbrook School, um, at, um, I got the time written down here somewhere, from 6 to 7.30. Um, Michael Nerdy's gonna be there. Um, I've actually heard Michael speak a couple times. Um, he's, a, he's an expert on um, the development of children, uh, youth risk, and uh, how kids process risk and how they make subsequent decisions. Focus um, pretty much because the collaborative is about um, uh, drug prevention, um, substance prevention. Um, so he focuses on that. I've seen him present twice. I saw him at a national conference, and I saw him once at BBA probably 10 years ago now. He's a phenomenal speaker. It's a long journey up to, to Londonderry. But if you're really interested in why, you're, why your 15 or 16-year-old kids or grandkids do certain things, you may want to call to listen to that. It's a, it's a fascinating uh, presentation. The last announcement I have is um, I've been talking about this for two, two meetings now. And I thought, if I didn't come in and announce this um, at this meeting, you would just think I was telling you that I was going to be doing this for months. But um, we have finally identified a steering committee, uh, that restructure that we did two months ago. And uh, I'll read off who's on the steering committee. And, and, and one person's probably in the room that I mentioned to and I didn't confirm with them, but they're going to hear their name in a minute. And I'll tell them, hey, remember you told me you would do this? <coughs> um, Kathy Clark is on it. Um, representing the clergy in our community. Um, Kate Bryant, uh, who would be here tonight, but her daughter Riley has a basketball game at Green Mountain College from Baton Kill Valley Health Center, uh, from the Health Services is on it. Um, Kelly Dickey, Kelly Keel Dickey, is the branch manager of the Bank of Bennington. Um, she, is, she has agreed to serve on the steering committee. Carolyn Blitz, um, Josh's better half, just kidding. Much better half. Much better half. Um, has agreed to serve on, on the steering committee. Tim Williams, who I, this is the one I talked about a while ago, would represent the select board. Nod your head, Tim. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I meant to say this here Saturday when we had breakfast and it kind of lost the conversation. But uh, Tim sort of agreed, but now he's agreeing to serve on the committee. 
Sarah Merrill, the principal of the high school, is going to serve on the committee. Rick Leonard has agreed to serve. He would be here tonight, but he's driving the varsity basketball team back from a scrimmage. Um, he has agreed, um, and again, for people who don't know uh, Rich real well, his Boy Scout background, he's probably, he's probably created more Eagle Scouts than any Boy Scout leader I've ever met. And so, um, plus his business background. I'm gonna serve on the steering committee, <coughs> and Lori and Holly will be supporting us as far as note taking. And the first meeting will be on the 11th of, of December next week, a week from today. Um, we're going to try to do a once a month breakfast meeting. And the idea of the steering committee, again, um, as I've said to each one of the people I've talked to, you only have to lift up a pen. It's really an hour and a half of brainstorming on issues in the community that we think we can address through the renewal project. And then we'll bring those out to the committees and try, try to stir, stir some energy around these issues, right? And so, um, that'll start um, next Tuesday morning at 8.30. Does anybody else have any other announcements? Jim, are you talking all about the farmer's market? Oh, yes. So, thank you. So, you know, we, we're into, we're into uh, week two, the inside farmer's market. Um, <coughs> the first week, I have to say, was slow. I'm not sure we picked the right night, the day after Thanksgiving, to do it. Um, I thought it picked up last week. I, I know one thing, the gal that was selling the Christmas reefs, those things were flying out of there. So I saw at least 10 she or 15 of them. She sold that. Yeah, I saw at least 10 or 15 of them leave the building. So sitting at the front door. <coughs> um, we have three more weeks left. Um, so Friday night again. Um, so a lot going on in town Friday night with the farmer's market, but also the play. So it runs from four to seven. It's at, it's at the Federated Church. Um, from talking to the vendors a little bit in the last couple weeks, they've emphasized over and over again, inside farmer markets in the winter are tough. Finding the right location, finding the right vendor. So we're gonna see where we go at the end of the three weeks we have left, five weeks, <clears throat> kind of reevaluate re that. But shortly after the first year, um, group, group working on the farmer's market. And I have to give Jessica, Jessica Roberts a call here, right? Jessica Grapp joined our group about three months ago, and she's really agreed to take on the lead of coordinating the farmer's market. The goal... She doesn't know she's agreed yet. She, she's agreed. Well, yeah. sort of like, she's going to the same way. She's sort of agreed, but listen, she, missed, here, she missed the meeting, so yeah, I mean, she agreed. don't ever miss a meeting. By default. Don't ever miss a meeting, because you miss a meeting. So, the goal would be, um, to do the farmer's market from like June through the summer, um, a little bit after Labor Day, see where it goes. Um, I would hope that um, we could generate enough funds where we pay someone to manage that for us. Because I will tell you, just from my perspective, over the summer, uh, the fall market and this market, um, I know, and again, I'm not complaining about this, but I, I know the commitment that I have to make and that Lori makes, and Jessica's been making, so we're gonna, we're gonna have to take a look at trying to figure out a way to manage that. <clears throat> but I think not to do something in, through the uh, you know, early summer into the fall would be a big mistake, because it was a big boom last year. People still talk about it, so. Yeah. Can I just inter interject sure. on that? Um, so, <coughs> so while Jim had mentioned that, the, that winter farmers markets are typically kind of difficult for, from a vendor perspective, this is something that we're learning is we got so many new vendors co contacting us for the winter based on our summer success, our little six week summer success where none of us knew what we were doing, right. but the vendors, thankfully, um, that, and, and, and we continue to get um, new vendors that want to come in and if we don't have room for them, can we, you know, so, so really the, the it's been a, an incredible success. It really has. Um, and we have some great vendors right and now. And we have a couple of veggie guns. Yeah, uh, we actually have vegetables at the winter market. There were concerns at the summer market. We have vegetables at the winter market. Yeah. Um, and also, for those of you, well, if you don't read the updates, um, so we, we because of the space that, that Kathy has said generously um, allowed us to use, as soon as I took a look at it, I said, what a great opportunity with a pass-through to do a coffee shop, community coffee shop fundraiser. So Kathy's um, Federated Church was the first, was the first week and 
even given the first week with not a whole lot of patrons coming through, you made what, 70 something dollars, right? Um, so I'm not sure what the line, did anybody hear from the Lions Club? I'm not sure what they made. I think they made about $50 from what I heard. Okay, well, $50 is $50. Mm -hmm. uh, um, it didn't pay for all the lights, but paid for a few strings, right? Um, th this week is gonna be the 4-H Club. Um, next week, the 14th, is going to be a pretty much grouped around the school. The school's gonna manage the community market. They're going to have, um, their art department is gonna have a little table that's selling ornaments that they're making. Um, we're gonna have probably some music from the school come in. Um, so it's gonna be a real a real school event. So um, we're hoping that that'll drive a lot of traffic that, that, that night. And, and if you talk to people about the market, one of the things we learned from the summer is it's not just a market. People found time to hang out with each other, catch up, and it became as much a social event as it was about you know buying the items that you might need. And we're hoping the winter market will be the same. And right. I, put, I put a plug in for the 21st, the very last Friday, um, Patty Cody um, will right. be leading a community carol sing from five to six in the church sanctuary while the farmer's market's going on. It's something that she she had annually done for many, many years at the high school and sometimes at the <coughs> church. Um, and so she will be leading that right. on the very on the, last yeah, on the Friday. And one more plug um, to Phyllis and the, and the library um, who have a weekly table and they are giving out books to kids. So your kids can either sit there and read them while you shop, they can walk around with them and they can take go home with them. You're not gonna, and, and they don't chase them out the door and say, no, 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 give us back our book. Um, so, um, so, so we thank Phyllis for that, for, for keeping the kids engaged. Okay, that's the farmer's market, big success. So anybody else for announcements? Yes, Steve. I have uh, two. Uh, tomorrow, I know it's not in our community, uh, but tomorrow uh, at the Vermont Veterans Homes, there's a community tree lighting down there, <clears throat> excuse me, at 5.30. And uh, more importantly, on the 15th, um, at about noontime, is Wreaths Across America. If you haven't been to one of those at the Vermont Veterans Home, there's a few hundred wreaths that go on the um, our veteran hero graves down there, and it is very moving and uh, very touching. So if you get the chance, uh, please come down down. What, what day is that? So you uh, that's uh, Saturday the 15th okay. at noontime okay. at the vet's home. Thank you. Good, thank you. Anybody else? Okay, so we've reached that point in the agenda. I know that Brian Allen is not here tonight to chair the school committee. Uh, there was a little bit of a meeting last night for us to, <clears throat> to gather just to kind of um, process um, the work that we did around the Section 9 report in Act 46. And so Brian's not here, so if school committee people, there may not be a committee chair here to break out, but I would encourage you to get into a breakout session. So who is here? Um, Alan is here, uh, along with Amy. So if we can break out into economic development arts, and, and, and Don, you're here, I don't need to, to break out into a group. Hoop, if you want to break out, I know you met last night, I was sitting in part of that meeting. But um, since we are running a little bit late, if we can do about 15 minutes of a breakout and then come back for a report out, okay? Um, I know that's cutting short on, on some conversation. And then I would ask um, maybe Lori and Holly, people that are on the town committee, could you maybe gather and get people up to speed um, on where we are with the town administrator position, sure. the conversations we're having with the select board? <coughs> and we'll report that out. Uh, we'll report that out where we are with that and the conversations that we're having. So, uh, Alan, if you want to take your call, I'm going to see it.